I prepared a talk which I think will perhaps lead into the discussion that we will be having this afternoon. Uh, I will talk about where I think set theory stands in the foundations of mathematics now. And I called it an old lady because, of course, set theory of, I would say, of the various uh, ways that we see foundations of mathematics, set theory is one of the oldest. And what do we feel about its place now? Uh, so that's what the talk is going to be. Uh, and it will offer a certain vision that I hold. So first, let me mention that set theory probably is a subject that has a very different outside image than the inside image. So what people who do not do set theory think that set theorists do tends to be rather different than what set theorists themselves think that they are doing. So I'm going to uh, give you some classical statements about set theory, what it is that set theory is for people who do not work inside. Uh, so here are some statements. Uh, so first of all, I, let me mention that there are many alternative ways to axiomatize set theory, of course. But I would say that the mainstream set theory is that axiomatized by the Mello-Frankel axioms with choice. So I will speak about that uh, set theory. Uh, when you want to axiomatize something, there are various things that you have to bring in. Some of them, one of them are the axioms. And set theorists generally tend to concentrate on that. But of course, there are two other ingredients. One of them is the logic that you use. Uh, and the third ingredient, as we have learned, uh, have been reminded about, is the deduction system. Uh, so I say we have been reminded about because, of course, the univalent foundations have brought upon us a new deduction system with many exciting developments. So uh, the mainstream set theory, therefore, is uh, viewed from the outside and from the inside, I would say, as consisting of ZFC axioms. Uh, now, in first order logic, but I would say uh, that from the outside, there are certain admirers also of the second order ZFC. Uh, I say here that this is for a bad reason, so let me explain what I mean. Uh, so if you axiomatize ZFC in the full second order way, then there is an old result of Zermelo from 1930s, which says that the only models of such a thing are of the form V kappa for kappa strongly inaccessible. So uh, some people uh, take this as some sort of categoricity of the second order set theory. Uh, of course, this isn't categoricity of second order theory, uh, set theory because there is a result from the 1970s already by uh, Scott and Levy uh, that uh, you can change the universe of set theory while preserving strongly inaccessible cardinals and changing, for example, the value of the continuum. So there is nothing really categorical about second order set theory that there isn't already about the first order set theory. But anyway, in the philosophical communities, there are certain admirers of this set theory. Uh, there are also, uh, of course, in set theory, large cardinals. Now. Uh, I would say that this is an issue on which the insiders and outsiders also do not always have the same view. Somehow people outside of set theory do not, cannot, I think, really appreciate why it is that we like large cardinals in set theory, because there, there are technical results that, uh, that depend so much on them that uh, make them interesting for us. But uh, so somehow they are taken as well maybe, yeah, Maybe that exists. But they, I don't think that this is quite a clarified notion in general. Uh, I'll say in a minute what it is that we think of them when I go to the inside image. Now, why, uh, why is set theory important in foundations of mathematics? Well, the reason is basically trivial. This is just because the notion of a set is a very general notion. And so using the notion of a set, you can uh, formulate many notions in mathematics as was found by Hilbert and Cantor in the days of naive set theory. And 
So Hilbert was particularly interested in formalizing mathematics, as we, of course, know. Cantor, I don't think, was interested in that aspect of set theory. Uh, but the, the thoughts of the two of them came together to form this important place that set theory has in foundations of mathematics. Uh, and, well, of course, once that set theory was properly axiomatized, uh, the cumulative hierarchy was developed. And cumulative hierarchy is a very nice and neat way of organizing sets in a hierarchy, and it has the nice property that most of the classical objects in mathematics, like the set of the real numbers, etc., that happen to be sets, I actually found quite low in this hierarchy. So this is how it looks, how it is. Uh, let me see now what is more an insider view. Uh, I think that uh, most people in set theory, within set theory, work within first order logic. Uh, I will tell you in a minute about some work in logic within set theory, which is very interesting. But classical set theory, mainstream set theory, happens in first order logic. And I think that there is a universal belief that there are large cardinals. Uh, why do I call this a belief? Uh, well, uh, the reason that I call this a belief is that we know that we cannot prove the existence of large cardinals in ZFC. So a large cardinal is not an object. It's actually a property that describes an object. And because of Gödel's incompleteness theorems, we'd say that, in particular, that if ZFC is consistent, it cannot prove its own consistency. And because of the completeness of first-order logic, we know that we cannot, in ZFC, construct a set model of ZFC. Now, if there was a cardinal which is even strongly inaccessible, so this is the weak, one of the weakest of these notions, then there would be a set model of ZFC. And uh, therefore, we, cannot, we know that we cannot prove the existence of such a cardinal by arguing in ZFC. Uh, of course, this doesn't mean that we cannot prove the non-existence of such a cardinal. And uh, if anybody ever were to prove that there are no such cardinals, that's, uh, that would uh, be uh, very bad news for us in set theory. But I think that we are quite confident that this doesn't happen, will not happen, because the large cardinals are very deeply connected with many aspects of set theory, with many somewhat uh, unexpected aspects, such as determinacy of certain games on real numbers. So properties of real numbers actually can be exactly matched with the properties of large cardinals. So large cardinals are widely accepted, and they come in a linear hierarchy, more or less. Uh, so. Then what is our view of foundations? Uh, I will say that perhaps not that many people actually work so much on foundations. Yes, there are people who work in foundations. But uh, somehow, set theory doesn't really uh, stop at realizing that real sign the cumulative hierarchy. What we do is we want to understand the mathematics of infinity. So uh, it's a very mathematical subject, which deals with certain objects that uh, do not come from classical mathematics. But then at the end, they do. I will show you some modern theorems to see actually how we have this nice connection with other areas of mathematics. Uh, and I would say that, well, you know, of course, there was much uh, discouragement to many people when it was discovered that CH was independent of the axioms of set theory. It was finally discovered in the 1960s. Uh, but actually, that was a consequence uh, Half of it was a consequence of what was known in the 1930s. Gödel had shown the, his uh, celebrated incompleteness theorem, which told us anyway that there will be some statement in set theory that is not provable in that of C or refutable. Uh, the big surprise, of course, was that that statement turned out to be as simply formulated as the continuum hypothesis, which states 
that all infinite subsets of the reals are bijective either with n or with the whole set of real numbers. So this is a statement that one can explain to a 10-year-old. And yet, this is not answerable by the axioms of set theory. So this was a big surprise. And well, uh, this was, of course, the nail Gödel's work. It was a, a kind of a nail in the coffin of the, of the first nail in the coffin of the Hilbert program. But as we all know, Hilbert program, even though it didn't work out completely the way that he wanted it to work out, actually was incredibly influential and still is influential. And uh, well, so in a sense, we take it, yeah, life is bad. We cannot do everything we want. But long live life, you know, we can uh, do many other things. So uh, let me then pass to some of the current ideas in set theory just to show you uh, what are some of the interesting topics. Uh, now, of course, it's very difficult to choose among the many interesting theorems that are being proven constantly uh, the device to present. And I am not going to claim here that I made some sort of rank order of theorems. I just chose some that, to me, are very interesting and I think are very much appreciated by the community. So I will show you some mathematical theorems first. Um, uh, but before showing that, actually, let me show you what people think about philosophy in mathematics, so in set theory. Uh, so these are somehow personal views, because most people that do set theory do not actually write what they think philosophically about it. So it's kind of hard to catch the tail of all these thoughts. But reading between the lines, talking to people, you can form certain opinions. So first, there is this uh, uh, work of Schellach uh, and his school. Of course, a celebrated logician, celebrated set theorist. Uh, who uh, the first part of his career was interested exclusively in ZFC results, uh, as he puts it, because I didn't know forcing, but I'm sure there were some deep results, reasons for that. And then developed this theory that, okay, since we don't know where, where life is going, at least we can trust ZFC. So whatever we prove in ZFC, it's, uh, it's sure to stay. But how do we know what we can prove in ZFC? Well, if we study independence results, then we will know what we cannot prove in ZFC. For example, we cannot prove the continuum hypothesis. So this is a philosophical view that he expressed through his work and also through some uh, uh, of his more philosophical writings. There are not that many compared to his mathematical writings. And uh, I think this is quite a solid, nice, pragmatic view. Then, of course, there has been, you know, since the 60s, there was, or even probably, yeah, since the 60s, there was a big effort to try to somehow complete the axioms of, the, of set theory to resolve this continuum hypothesis. So this result that I have just quoted about large cardinals not being able to do so was a big disappointment because people had hoped that the large cardinals will solve the continuum hypothesis. Uh, and many, many tries have been tried in the, in the meantime, and I would say that it mostly comes from California school, and uh, the modern proponent is Wooden, and I will give you some of his ideas in a minute. Okay, so some people sometimes ask me, well, why don't you just accept V is equal to L? It's an axiom. It resolves the continuum hypothesis, you know, so why worry about life? Let's just accept V is equal to L. Uh, and there are certain, mostly philosophical, I would say, proponents of this. Uh, I do not know any set theorist who believe that we should accept V is equal to L as an axiom. Uh, I personally do not think that this is reasonable at all because uh, restricting ourselves to only definable sets actually uh, takes out many of the constructions that are very natural in mathematics. Yes? What does V equals L stand for? Uh -huh. oh, thank you for asking this question. So L is the constructible hierarchy. 
that was constructed by Gödel. And let me just say uh, what, how it is done. So if you think of the uh, cumulative hierarchy, that's, that's, that looks something like this. You start with the empty set, that is your V0. Then your V1 is the power sets of the empty set, so, so the power sets of V0. And you keep going, Vn plus 1 is the power set of Vn. You come to a limit ordinal, you take the union. So V omega is the union of all Vn. And you keep going like this throughout all the ordinals, because all ordinals are either successor or limit, you will find. And you have this V, which is the, a class, it's a proper class of all V alpha. And this is the cumulative hierarchy, which has the property that, uh, unfortunately, in it we cannot decide the continuum hypothesis. Now, Gödel had this brilliant idea that maybe we should redo this construction and be a little bit more careful at the successor stages. So rather than taking as here V alpha plus one is the whole P of V alpha, we can redo this construction by taking L alpha plus one to be just the definable subsets of L alpha. So you do the same, but your subsets are definable. So that means that has to be some formula and some parameter that you can define your set with. And that gives you something that is inside of V, like that. And what we know about it is that it satisfies the continuum hypothesis. Moreover, it satisfies the generalized continuum hypothesis. But uh, it is not decidable within the axioms of ZFC if these two things are the same. So if you just accept as an extra axiom that these two things are the same, so that would mean V is equal to L, then your life is easy because you have decided the continuum hypothesis and all kinds of other things. So that's basically the idea between the proof of Gödel that it is consistent from the axioms of ZFC that CH is true. Uh, so, but why don't we just take this as an axiom and then we go home? Yes? How do we write that equation by the formula? Uh, that equation can be written as an axiom, but it's not trivial. So if you want to see the formula, look at Kuhnen's book. It has to do with defining definability. That's actually a chapter in this book. <laughs> okay, so it's a, it's a book by Kenneth Conan. Probably you know it's set theory. Okay, so anything basically that you construct by transfinite induction tends to be non-definable in this way. So that's why this is a restrictive axiom. Okay, so let's see some other axioms. Let me say what forcing axioms are. So forcing axioms say that the universe is sort of saturated for certain kinds of forcing. So to prove uh, the negation of CH, what you need to do is to take a very simple notion of forcing, which is some sort of a partial order, and you repeat many times the construction. This is adding a coin real, and you end up with a universe that, in which you have added so many reals that the continuum hypothesis is no longer true. Uh, so a forcing axiom is a statement that says that the universe is already saturated by this kind of construction. So for example, in your universe, you can already repeat inside of the universe without leaving it the construction of adding coin reels. So already in your universe, you will have at least that the continuum fails, but the, a continuum hypothesis fails, but then you will have some other things. So a universe is kind of fed around the middle. It is fed around the, it is all about omega and omega one. Uh, the, and there are several of those forcing axioms on the market. They provide a very nice way of doing mathematics of the infinite without really necessarily understanding logical aspects of it. So for example, there is something called Martin's axiom that was 
taken up by the analysts and people in Banner space theory, in measure theory, because it's easy to do, it's totally combinatorial. If you accept this as an axiom, then you can do combinatorics and prove interesting results, but you don't ever need to learn forcing. Uh, well, some other forcing axioms are much more complicated than that, but anyway, they, they somehow speak of the saturation of the universe, and there are some very small number of people who think we should accept them as axioms. So the good point of accepting this as an axiom would be that it also resolves, uh, if you, for example, take the proper forcing axiom, it implies that the, the, the cardinality of the continuum is Aleph 2. So it resolves that question. Uh, well, I think the bad point of this is that really they're not very intuitive. You know, would you say that the following is an axiom for every semi-proper notion of forcing uh, of size Aleph 1, uh, and for every Aleph 1 many dense sets in this notion of forcing, there is a generic filter that intersects it. It seems to me this is not a very natural axiom. It wasn't meant as a natural axiom. It was meant as an exploration of what one can do with the methods of set theory. So I think that the, there are not many people who believe in this as axioms, although there are some philosophical works, notably by Giorgio Venturi, about this. And maybe of the set theorist, maybe Magidor sometimes says that it could be the case. <laughs> so maybe he thinks about it as something possible. But I think, you know, what is also interesting that these philosophical issues and foundational issues seem to have somehow uh, moved out for, from the center of set theory. And somehow a large majority of set theorists really want to do mathematics and not to do philosophy. Uh, so let me show you what uh, theorems we tend to prove. So here is a theorem that I think is really beautiful. It's from 2006. Uh, well, as you can see, it doesn't mention any axioms. It mentions one infinite cardinal, two infinite cardinals. Let me tell you what it is about. Uh, it's a question asked in a very classical part of mathematics in Banach spaces. In Banach spaces, you can do much if you assume that the Banach space has a countable dense subsets. Such things are called separable. And the classical theory of Banach space is centered very much on this issue. But if you do not have this assumption, you have, of course, natural constructions of such spaces, but then uh, there wasn't much known about them. And it turns out that the reason for this is that many things are independent. So the field of Banach spaces, non-separable Banach spaces, had a big revival in the last I would say maybe 15 years, and many of their questions were shown to be independent. And this question, though, is not independent. That's why it is so interesting. So let me tell you what a biorthogonal system is. So a uh, Banach space is a special vector space, and in a vector space, you look at nice kind of bases. And it turns out, when you look at Banach spaces, that you cannot always have a basis that looks like the one that is in Rn, which is the orthonormal basis that everybody likes, in which you have some vectors that actually multiply to, to zero and that are orthogonal. Yeah? So a biorthogonal system is some sort of generalization of this kind of uh, orthonormal basis. And it was proved in the 60s that every infinite dimensional Banach space has a at least a sequence of length omega of such biorthogonal vectors. And the question was, if you increase the density, can you then get at least length omega 1? And it turns out that this is independent because the examples uh, that you cannot have, that there is no such thing and the density is Aleph 1. But it is very surprising to see that if you have density Aleph 2 or more, you will ne necessarily have an uncountable biotognal system. So this statement is easy to explain to people who's, who know even just a little bit of analysis. Yet the proof of this statement goes through studying consequences of very highly 
forcing axioms, such as the one that I have just mentioned, the one called semi-proper forcing axiom or Martin axiom. So the proofs of these results are very set theoretical, yet the statement is not. So this is why I think that this result is very beautiful. Uh, uh, then, yeah. I know what it is for vectors to be orthogonal. Let's say five orthogonal. This means you have a sequence of vectors and functionals. So there are two sequences, and between them they are uh, orthogonal, so they are like this. You have points x alpha, let us say alpha less than omega 1, and you have some functionals, let's call them phi alpha. And then when you apply phi alpha to x beta, you get the Kronecker delta. You get zero if it is. Okay, so now the second result is also very beautiful, I think. It's also simple, but you need to know what this diamond is. But let me tell you what diamond is. Uh, I think after the continuum hypothesis, the other most popular independence result is that of the existence of a Suslin tree. So a Suslin tree is a weird object which uh, completely denies the uh, the Koenig lemma at Aleph 1. So Koenig lemma says you have a tree with finite branching, infinite height, there will be an infinite branch. Now, a Suslin tree is the total opposite of it, but at Aleph 1. So you have height omega 1, you have that all chains and antechains are countable. So this looks like a contradiction, and in fact, the existence of such a thing is independent of the axioms. This was a very, very important question in set theory that actually came from an even more important question about the characterization of the real numbers. So there, was, there are several characterizations of real numbers, and there was a question once in the 19th century if in one of those characterizations you can replace the notion of separability by something weaker, and this weaker statement uh, is an analog of not having uncountable antechains. And this, the, the counterexample to this characterization became known as the Suslin line. And then it was realized in the 30s by Kurepa that the Suslin line and the Suslin tree imply each other. So that's why the Suslin line and Suslin trees are important in mathematics and set theory, and much work was put before the ideas of independence came through to show that there is a Suslin line. Now, uh, this L and the Susan line are very connected because actually L satisfies that there exists a Susan tree in L, a Susan line. And this wasn't shown by Gödel. Gödel had a very fine analysis of L where he showed that uh, it satisfies the general continuum hypothesis. He perfectly well knew the Susan problem, but he was missing an ingredient that was developed in the 70s by Jensen who showed that there is a certain combinatorial principle, diamond, uh, which holds in L, so diamond of, of Aleph 1, and this diamond of Aleph 1 implies that there exists a Susan tree. So that's a celebrated result of Jensen. And then the question was, well, is that because this diamond is some sort of hidden version of the continuum hypothesis? It is obvious that it implies the continuum hypothesis, but is this the other way around? And then through some very deep work again by Jensen, it was shown that the continuum hypothesis doesn't imply diamond. But this result of Shellac shows that as soon as you move from Aleph 1, so you go up, then the relevant instance of the continuum hypothesis actually does imply diamond. So this is something that shows that cardinals above Aleph 1 are actually very special. So uh, another result that I like very much, and it was proved by using ideas developed for PCF theory. Now here is another result. In set theory, we sometimes have things that happen independently. And so these two groups of people showed independently in 2004 this very beautiful result that again has to do with a very old problem. Uh, so I don't know if you have already heard of the Scottish book. The Scottish book was a uh, 
notebook that was held in the Scottish cafe in the city of Lwów, uh, which is now in Ukraine and that then was in Poland. Between the two world wars, uh, the group of mathematicians working there, including Bana and Ulam, met and posed questions and answered them in this book, and they kept it in the cafe uh, with the in which you know it was uh, it was actually in the care of the cafe keeper, and most of the quest, this this book survived by miracle. Most of the people who wrote in the book didn't survive the Second World War, but the book did, and uh, most of the questions in that book have connections with deep deep parts of mathematics, and uh, all of them have now been answered, I believe. And the last one was this. Uh, so there was a question of von Neumann, who formed part of that group before going to Princeton, in which he asked, how can we recognize Boolean algebras on which we can put a measure? So a measure is a function on the Boolean algebra, which is countably additive, and uh, in which we have that every non-zero element has positive measure. And he proposed two conditions that are easily seen to be necessary. And he asked if this was sufficient. It was in the 1930s that he asked this question. And well, then uh, the next step in it was done by Baharam in the 1940s, which he, in which he said, which he studied the re related notion of something weaker than a measure. It's called Maharam submeasure. And this result that they proved in 2004 showed that von Neumann was right to a certain extent. Uh, it shows that under certain axiom, which is called P-ideal dichotomy, at least the conditions of von Neumann are sufficient to have a Maharam submeasure. And the reason that this is so interesting is that just a year after, Talagran showed in a celebrated paper that conditions of von Neumann are not enough, just in ZFC, for a real measure. And this question is connected with the control measure problem. So for those of you who know probability, this work of Talagran showed, solved the control measure problem. And therefore, this result that these two groups of people obtained independently is the best possible that you can have in any universe of set theory. So these are some recent theorems in set theory. Uh, let us see, we don't only do with classical mathematics. Let me show you also some recent theorems in which people do think about logic. So how do we think about logic in set theory? What kinds of questions do we answer? Uh, so here I, I put several results. Uh, so one thing that is very well put question about L has brought to, to uh, now let me talk about is, you see, when I talked about L to you, I said definable subsets. So to construct L alpha plus one, I take definable subsets. It means I define by a formula. Now you may ask, where do I take the formula? What is the logic that I take the formula? So the one that Gödel used is the first order logic, which on these slides appear in many names. So L omega omega is first order logic. Uh, later it is going to be also called F or L in some slides. Okay, so that's the logic we love and like, and that gives you L. But these three people, Kennedy, Magador, and Van Annen, Ask how about some other logics? What do you, if you do you get a different hierarchy if you change your logic when you define what definable means? In fact, it was already done in the 60s for L omega one omega one, in which Scott showed that you get a Chang model with that logic. But they have put that much further, and they have studied many logics, and have this encyclopedic body of knowledge of definable subsets in various logics. That's a recent work that was just completed a few months ago. Uh, then let me 
talk about Wutensberg. I already mentioned that he is very, uh, in his work has been interested, among other things, in this completion of axioms. Can we find some other way of doing set theory in which we can actually resolve the continuum hypothesis? So here are two tries to it, which are actually contradictory. So the first try is that we change the logic to something that is called omega logic. Uh, this logic is defined using forcing. So this is quite a, it's not a logic like, uh, it's not defined in a way that you might be used to seeing logic. But it is a logic. And if this logic is complete and sound, then doing things in this logic implies that continuum hypothesis is false. And this was quite some, you know, they were some, this was quite a big move in set theory, and uh, even the American Mathematical Society devoted two issues of the notices to this work. And, uh, well, however, this remained a conjecture because the soundness and completeness and soundness is called as the omega conjecture that has never been proved. In the meantime, Wooden has also gone to study the opposite situation. So uh, L, our favorite friend from today, is also connected with, can be connected with large cardinals. So it can be proved that from some rather low level on, L cannot have large cardinals. So you cannot have a measurable cardinal in L, for example. But nevertheless, you can have kind of a measurable cardinal version of L, so something which is called L of mu, for example, where mu is a measure. So this looks like L, but has a measure. And it's simply constructed. You can have then much more complicated versions of L, but which still looks like L. They're called core models, uh, which have some large cardinal properties. But there is one large cardinal property for which we don't know how to make an L-like model. It's called the supercompactness. And it's, it's a favorite to set theorists. We use it a lot. But we don't know how to make an L-like model for it. And doing that has been a, a very, very much an open question, kind of. It's the blue sky research in set theory of inner models. And this work that Wooden has done talks about the possibility of having L in which there is exactly one supercompact cardinal. And he calls this the ultimate version of L. And if this thing exists, then the continuum hypothesis is actually true. So these are two conjectures based both on a lot of mathematical work, uh, two conjectures that negate each other. So we don't know which one or if any one of them actually is true. Uh, let me also uh, keep with the tradition of say, saying a little bit of what kinds of things interest me personally on this subject uh, since I'm giving this talk. So I would like to announce this work that I'm doing with Joko Vananen, the same person from the first theorem. Uh, so we studied a certain logic which is called lambda C kappa kappa, so let me say what that is. L omega omega is called L omega omega because it allows you to take less than omega variables and less than omega many conjunctions. That is finitely many variables and finitely many conjunctions. So this means variables and less than omega uh, operations. Now, an obvious way to try to generalize this is to change your omega for some other cardinal number. So you could have logics of the type L kappa lambda, where you, where you have these two parameters. And in general, they turn out to be really horrible. One thing that we love about the first order logic is compactness. They, never, they are very rarely compact. Having them to be compact involves large cardinals. And well, so they are not a very, very nice logics to work with. But we discovered with, with Vanan and many properties of a version of this, when you take kappa to be a singular cardinal of cofinality omega, so cofinality omega means something like Aleph omega, 
of aleph omega, you can write it as an increasing sequence of omega many steps. So even though it's quite a huge guy, you can describe it in quite a short phase. So these are singular cardinals. <laughs> and if you work with kappa of that form, you look at L kappa kappa, and then you change the notion of satisfaction to mention something called chain models. I won't go to that. You get a very nice logic. This logic was discovered by Carol Karp in the 60s and uh, early 70s, and she discovered some nice properties. Unfortunately, her work was cut short by her premature death, and somehow it wasn't continued. So we took it up a few years ago and discovered many nice properties of this. And one thing that we are working on right now is that to show that this, uh, we uh, believe to have shown that this logic has a certain compactness. So when you put the cardinal in front of the compactness, this cardinal here is beta omega, but it could be any cardinal. It just means that if you have a set of sentences such that every subset of a smaller side is satisfiable than, th of, than that cardinal, then the whole set is satisfiable. So the usual compactness becomes aleph zero compactness. So we show some compactness, and this compactness implies some combinatorial results due to Shellach that are quite celebrated. So he proved the singular compactness theorem in which he shows that if you have a singular cardinal, then you cannot have the white head phenomenon. For example, if you have a group such that every small subgroup is free, then the whole group is free. Yes? What is the, sorry? Uh, this is LC, kappa kappa C means for chain models. This means that the notion of satisfaction is defined differently than in Tarski. It's defined using something called the chain models. Yeah. Okay, so these are some logically oriented results. So that's basically the kinds of things, and it's an example of the kinds of things that people look at in set theory. And I thought this was a nice moment to give you a quotation from this wonderful book on the foundations of set theory uh, by Frankel, Hillen, and Levy, the same Frankel from uh, the Frankel axioms. Uh, Levy, who is still active, is about 90 years old, and I don't, they haven't known Hillel. Anyway, they have this very beautiful book. And they say that most authors who occupy themselves with the foundations of mathematics have exhibited a curious unsteadiness in matters philosophical. It was only natural for them to ascribe these changes of mind to their increasing maturity of thinking and to regard their later positions as better justified than their earlier ones in whatever direction the shift might have gone. So perhaps this applies nicely to, even though this is cynical, I think there is some nice truth in this, which shouldn't be taken cynically. Uh, so what we had before are these propositions of Wooden with, you know, 11 years difference. Uh, simply, set theorist, I think, very much believe that it is mathematics that should lead said theory, that it is really a subject that is very interesting philosophically. It's very interesting foundationally, but really it is not interesting if it doesn't respond to the community of mathematicians. Uh, and I think that's maybe what they mean here, that people will be willing to change their philosophy in order not to change their mathematics. So, let me then maybe give you a little bit of uh, my own vision of where the foundations of mathematics are now, and perhaps uh, since this is a conference devoted to the relation between set theory and univalent foundations, I will certainly speak about that, but I will also speak about another way of formalizing mathematics. And, well, my vision is pluralist, and let me explain what that means to me. So let me say what other approaches are to formalizing mathematics. So one thing that came out quite early, came up quite early, was this Russell paradox in which he showed that the class of all sets is not a set. So uh, the whole 
axiomatizations of Zermelo and Frankel uh, is related to answering this paradox, certainly Zermelo's comprehension axiom. And this paradox teaches us that there are objects in mathematics that are not formalizable in set theory. So just the fact that you can formalize the reals doesn't mean you can formalize everything. And even though at that time, this was probably more of a philosophical curiosity, very soon people came up with huge portions of mathematics in which you actually need to do work with proper classes. And an answer to how you could formalize this kind of mathematics is category theory. So it proposes formalizing objects that are proper classes in terms of categories and their morphisms. So you could have the category of pure sets, or you could have more interesting categories of certain topological spaces, geometrical objects, etc. So this category theory is very appropriate for the study of mathematical objects which you want to study by their abstract properties by looking at all examples of such a thing. And it has met with a large success uh, in subjects such as algebraic geometry. It also has uh, developments past the basic category theory, such as the theory of toposes, etc. And, uh, well, I guess uh, in the past, there has been or there was quite a heated discussion on the subject of the preference for sets or for categories. So people spent an enormous amount of time and paper on writing about, you know, you can formalize categories in sets if you do this and this and that, and then you twist and whatever, you know. So you can actually just completely give up categories and only work in sets, or vice versa. So much discussion is, was done on this subject, some of that very heated, some of this very interesting as well. There is a paper of Pfeffer, several papers of Pfefferman where he discusses this. He answers McLean. There is the work of Matthias. But since I already declared myself as a pragmatist, I actually think that these two approaches should not be interpreted one in terms of another. They should just be taken as complementary, dealing with complementary parts of mathematics. And they are not contradictory. This is very interesting, good. This is, you know, what we need to know. They don't contradict each other. And so let them live. That's what I think. Uh, so let me speak on a subject on which many of you know much more than I do, and you have devoted this conference to it, the Univalent Foundations, which are a very, very exciting uh, new approach to foundations of mathematics. So I'll just summarize, summarize the way that I see them, that these are foundations for constructive mathematics. They have brought unexpected connections between the type theory and homology theory. Uh, and what is new in this, this as, as I said, this is not that you've changed the logic, it's not that you've changed the axioms, you've changed the method of deduction. So this is something that one has to bear in mind, that our foundation also depends on how we draw our deductions. And this is what univalent foundations brought to us. Uh, and what is really interesting as well with this new approach is that it works well with computer assistants. So uh, one can formalize important parts of mathematics uh, in assistants such as Koch or Agda, to verify proofs. So in fact, it's interesting how this all came out to have a mathematician who is a field medalist, who can publish whatever he likes, but he feels that nobody is able to check his proofs because they are too long, and nobody is willing to check his proofs, and starts thinking about how could this be changed? How could this beautiful mathematics that I know become more verifiable? And then uh, in, with this naive but very intelligent idea comes to understand connections with proof assistants. And I think this is very important. Whoever has been a referee knows how difficult it is to check certain papers. And I wish that uh, Koch advances very quickly and that it comes something that can, only not, that can not only verify, but also kind of correct trivial mistakes. 
because this is something that's also very hard. When you read a paper as a referee, and the author all of a sudden starts calling his alpha beta, and you don't know if this was a mistake or it was actually done on purpose. So there is, I think this is a very promising direction, and very, one can go very far and in both directions of more mathematics to include and also a more computable approach to change the approach, not just to verification, but to other things. So, um, and what is interesting that the univalent foundations also have a very nice connection with set theory. That is, there is this uh, axiom of univalence, which, which is central to univalent foundations, and the univalent foundations with these axioms are consistent modulo the consistency of ZFC. This is a result of Voivodsky, and this says, you know, that's fine, do your univalent foundations, do your set theory, you are not going to contradict each other. Uh, and, well, Wojewodski put it very nicely in a talk that I was present at in the Logical Oak film 2013, where he said that the ZFC set theory will remain the most important benchmark of consistency. So somehow we believe ZFC set theory. It would be, I think mathematics would be quite strange if it turned out that ZFC theory is not be to be believed. So we can use it as some sort of measure of consistency. And his result that we have just stated says that the univalent foundations are as consistent as the set theory. So where do we find ourselves? Here are pictures of three large cities. Uh, maybe you can guess them. Uh, so let me start with the one there. It is the Sorbonne in Paris. This here is just a typical view from a London apartment, it happens to be mine. And this here is Harlem in New York. And this is uh, Clayton Powell, one of my favorite personalities. These three cities are, I think, all three fantastic and very, very different from each other. And I have no problem spending, as I have been doing for many years in my life, parts of my existence in uh, all three of them. Uh, I think foundations of mathematics are sort of like that. Um, let me try to get to, to my conclusion by getting inspired from what people do very willingly and without asking for the second time if this is right or not in computer sciences. So computer scientists like to model things. And to computer sciences, it, scientists, it is completely obvious that if you want to model something, you should use whatever is appropriate. Shouldn't choose always the same logic to, to uh, model various things. It is not possible, it's not interesting. So let me just give some example. So for example, in artificial intelligence, which is of course of relevance to what we have been discussing, the first order logic is kind of in the opposite direction than it is in set theory. In set theory, it's kind of the weakest interesting logic. So then we can extend it. But in computer sciences, in artificial intelligence, it's actually the strongest possible logic. It's FOL is like of the limit, and it's, it is too expressive. It expresses things that are not expressible by a computer. So instead, when you want to do something in, in artificial intelligence, you would rather use a fragment. So I took this example of expert systems, the fragment if then. Or in the concurrent systems, people would use temporal logic, which comes from model logic, so uh, another logic simply, because it's just, you know, if you want to do parallel computing, you want to know the time. So it would be very silly to use this, any logic that doesn't have an element of time. Uh, and well, I couldn't resist but to say that the good old set theory is also relevant in these things. So here is the semantics of the web used for deductive classificators. And this is an application which somehow uh, translates deductions into set theory. So you see here you have three very interesting parts of computer sciences using three different logics. Nobody's worried, people in full uh, uh, 
fully consciously use different logic for different parts of what they are interested in. I think we need to do this in mathematics. Yeah, I, I don't think that uh, one should even argue about this, what kind of foundation we should use. So my conclusion is that all three of those uh, large part of foundations that we have discussed in this talk have their place, and they have a place in those parts of mathematics that are uh, to, the, to which they are useful. So set theory has its place because it gives foundations for an important part of mathematics and because it's very consistent with the mathematical practice. This is an important thing when you do foundations. You want to have mathematics which is well matched with your foundations and set theory is good in that. Then category theory does the same, but two different parts of mathematics. So algebraic geometry, sheaves, whatever. These things really need categories, and they are well matched. So category theory certainly has a place to play in, in the foundations. And well, let me repeat what I've said about the univalent foundations. I think they, are, they have given us a very interesting new development, which uh, give us a new way to discuss proofs, and proofs are a central notion everywhere in mathematics. And so just the conclusion is, I think that these three things coexist, there are others as well. These are not the only foundational issues in mathematics. Uh, and well, I will finish here, thank you. So are there any questions? And please use the microphone. Yes. Hello, I'm sitting here. Hi. That was Hi. a very uh, nice overview. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I wanted maybe, if I'm allowed to do some comments. So first of all, category theory is also used c quite a lot in computer science for yes. study of programming language. I guess you're aware of this. Um, and although I think there is an interesting relation between the two last points you make. Uh, so I find always category theory is very nice, but in a way, it's just a way to structure things, yeah? Uh, I mean, it, it gives you like a um, terminology, uh, which is very useful, but it doesn't really tell you in a way what's right, yeah? Uh, or what's wrong, it's, it's structural. Whereas uh, uh, type theory, I mean, this is univalence uh, axiom, um, it closes this gap in a way because it fits very well together with category theory in the sense that the construction in type theory are, are uniquely identified by the universal properties. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so it fits very well with category theory uh, as an abstract way of doing mathematics, but it, 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 it fills this gap of, of actually telling you what you're allowed to do. Mm -hmm. so, well, so that's a very nice point, and this point about category theory, you are right that many have felt this, and even in some of those articles that I have quoted that was stated. Uh, so indeed, you are right, this is the, the, the univalent foundations, the type theory gives, a, a fits that gap, if, as you put it. Uh, I would say that even if we were not able to fit that gap, I would still say that category theory is interesting to use, because even though you can translate everything every time you do something, it doesn't, it is not practical, and if it isn't practical, while you are doing your translation, you will probably miss seeing some properties of the object you want to study. So I think category theory, although I haven't done any work personally in it, I can admire that uh, certain properties would have been much more difficult to notice if there wasn't for this language of category theory. So that's, that's another reason why I've studied. Yes. If you allow for uh, three different foundations, and possibly more, depending upon what happens in the future, is the word foundation appropriate? No, it's the word, the word is foundations. That is the word that we have been using. Well, my house has one foundation. I wouldn't want a house that had more than one foundation, or the foundations in different parts. It's not a good house to buy. Uh, yes, but life is more complicated than buying a house. 
<laughs> you apparently did not live through the, the financial meltdown in 2008. No, but you, you can have one house in New York, one house in Paris, one house in London, so... Yeah, some of us do, <laughs> yes. So we have a different conversation. Yeah, you. So um, just because you list three things on a slide doesn't make them foundations. I mean, I don't think category theory is a foundation. I mean, despite the fact that there was that work by Pfefferman and McLean, which I regard as interesting, but actually not at all useful. Um, well, categories. that's not what she says. Set theory, foundations, the word foundations is there for all of us. Yeah, so I'm, I'm contradicting that. Yes, but I, he I mean, says that category theory is not I don't not regard category theory in the same way as, it's not foundational in the same way that set theory and type theory claim to be foundational, I would say. Right. Uh, because it, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's not a foundation on which you build everything. It's a language in which you explain the structure of things. But those things are built maybe out of sets or maybe out of types. But the category theory helps you understand some of their properties. But it doesn't, it doesn't I would say, act as something out of which everything else comes. Oh, yes, of opinion. course, if you take the, the, the very Greek word. Uh, you know, understanding of these thread foundations, but I believe that foundations in mathematics is more important for why we want to have good foundations is to discover good theorems, not because we want to have a nice basement in the house and to go and spend the day. In it. <laughs> so I think that from this point of view, category theory has proven its place. And uh, yeah. So. Uh, I can understand uh, that the ZFC, ZFC is very good benchmark of consistency because it has very reasonable consistency strength, but uh, I think that uh, it is one thing to say that uh, one theory can show or measure consistency of the other, it can be used to implement the other or interpret the other, and another is to take uh, at, at face value, the picture of I don't know infinity or continuum that it uh, depicts. Just, uh, just as an example, uh, you said that uh, it's absolutely accepted by everybody that we need to take uh, ZFC as the minimal axioms. It makes sense again if you mean that any theory that we take uh, as foundation should be as strong at least as ZFC in terms of consistency strength. But it doesn't mean that the picture of, let's say, continuum that ZFC provides is the one and only ultimate possible one. Just, just by the way of example, if you compare it with AD plus, plus DC, it mm -hmm. provides, of course, its consistency strength is much bigger than that of ZFC, uh, but uh, you can very well argue that the picture of, uh, that, that it's much better setting to do calculus than, than standard uh, ZFC. And uh, what would be, what, what would be your take on this? Uh, I mean, it, it, do you, mm -hmm. so do you believe in ZFC just as a benchmark to measure consistency, and also as giving philosophical picture of, of infinity? Uh, well, this is a very good point. ZF and ZFC are equally equiconsistent, and to, to have uh, AD, you would at least have ZF with it. Uh, I do not believe that ZFC gives us the, uh, uh, the only possible pictures of the reals, uh, and I certainly agree with you that there are other views. In this talk, I have said at the beginning I will do mainstream set theory, so that's which I defined for this talk to be ZFC, but I do not personally believe that this is the only set theory. So what the point that you are bringing is that there is more than one set theory, there isn't just ZFC, etc. So this is quite complex as you point out. Uh, however, from the point of equiconsistency results, I think ZFC is a good benchmark. Uh, well, you know, there are people who will not accept anything more than piano arithmetic. There are some nice theorems you can prove in piano arithmetic. I don't say that this is not valuable, but I think that, uh, that for a mathematician in general, they do not seem to particularly care if you need ZFC or if you need piano arithmetic. Uh, you know, logicians are trying to solve this question if the Fermat's last theorem can be proved using just piano arithmetic, which would actually mean could Fermat really have solved it? I think this is a fantastic question. 
But if you ask the number theorists, they go like, well, okay. <laughs> so of course, in all of this, there is a matter of taste. Uh, and there is a matter, we all are biased. And so, yes, I am probably more biased to ZFC set theory, but your point is very well taken. If there are the set theorists. Yes, uh, boss. So you mentioned the uh, uh, Vladimir Vavotsky's remark about the gold standard. So is, as he indicated here, his thinking has developed a bit since, I mean, since that time. Um, so the, for the univalent foundations, you, you in fact need a much weaker system to actually model it. So some predictive variant is, is enough. That's already has been mentioned. Um, so, so it's not clear. Mean, sorry, sorry, I don't understand. Because his theorem is that these two theories are equiconsistent. So what you mean, what you are interested in? No, that's in? not true. Well, that's the theorem he claimed. Uh, let us see, where was that theorem? Aha, uh -huh. oh, I see. So what you are saying, that they are actually consistent module or something weaker than ZFC, right? Yeah. OK. So, you, I mean, you, uh, add, you I, I mean, as, as I also showed, I mean, if you um, add, say, the X-Men of choice to the univalent foundations, then you can build a model of ZFC. But okay. you don't need to do that, of course. So you can build a model of univalent foundations in a fairly weak system, certainly in a predictive weaker system. Weaker than ZF, then? Much weaker, yes. I, well, that's very interesting. I wasn't yeah. aware of that. OK, thanks. Yes? Um, I just wanted to add, I mean, uh, regarding that about foundations and category theory, I mean, if you really want, you can do that. And I think this is what Lavea proved. But it's, the question is if it really gives a very different conception if you still use first order logic and then you use the first order theory of some elementary topos, but it's it's maybe not a huge conception or change regarding, uh, compared to uh, set theory. And, but it also gives same consistency strengths and interpretation and et cetera, et cetera. Is this a question to me? Or no, yeah, it was question? just an um, remark on, on that question. Remark on the yeah. previous question, yeah. yes, indeed. Uh, yes, well, there are many subtle issues that are coming up in this discussion. There is a question of matching things together by their consistency strength. There is a question of matching things together because you can by interpret them. And this is not the same question. So yes, this is interesting. Yes, you have by interpretation with this result, indeed. OK, let's have a break now. Thank you very much. Thank Bye you. Now.